Plants Changing Planet seminar, where we're delighted to um, host Professor Sir Andy Haynes. Um, so Andy is actually a professor of now environmental change and uh, public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, he was previously the director of LSHTM and was also a professor of primary healthcare at UCL and has previously been a GP as well. Um, I'm sure some of you actually probably know Andy as well, particularly down the road. Um, Again, Andy's been on many sorts of working groups and committees, but the, the most recent one is probably the Rockefeller Foundation and Lancet Commission on Planetary Health, which is what our actual talk will be about today as well. So um, if we can put our hands together to welcome Andy, that would be great. Thank you. Well, uh, thank, thanks very much. Can you all hear me? Is it is good? Yep. So thanks very much for inviting me, and it's a great pleasure to speak to you this evening. As you've already heard, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the work we started off when I shared this uh, commission for the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet, but things have evolved and developed a bit since then, and I'll try and reflect some of those developments in what I'm going to say. I, I should preface it by saying, I, of course, am not a, an expert in all of these areas. What I'm going to be talking about is a very broad canvas, and some of you probably know more details about some element, uh, elements of that agenda than I do. But what I'm going to try and do is to really describe some of the evolving challenges that face human health and development in this new geological epoch that we're living in, the Anthropocene epoch. Um, the definition we can debate, there are a number of different definitions, this is the kind of simplest <coughs> one, but what it's trying to capture is the fact that human health ultimately depends on underpinning natural systems which provide clean air, water, food, disease control, a whole range of ecosystem services. And these underpin uh, the civilization that we're fortunate, really, to live in uh, today. So the Anthropocene Epoch really uh, follows the Holocene, which, as you know, I think the Holocene Epoch lasted for 11,700 years or so. It was a time of relative climatic and environmental stability during which human civilization was able to evolve. So we evolved from hunter-gatherers into <coughs> agriculturalists and into predominantly urban populations, which is what we are today. And the Anthropocene was announced, if you like, by something which has been called by many people the Great Acceleration, which is, um, I don't know if you can see it, I don't know if you can see the screen very well here. Let me, um, well, I have to sit and stand over here to operate the slides. But anyway, the Great Acceleration, people, debate about where that actually started to happen, but it probably, it sort of became noticeable around the middle of the, the last century, but arguably it started to happen before then. So on the one hand, you see these dramatic socioeconomic trends, and they have been very, very dramatic indeed. I mean, humans have made um, unprecedented progress in recent decades. Life expectancy has uh, increased by about 20 years since the middle of the last century. There's been dramatic declines in infant mortality and maternal mortality and so on. Absolute poverty has declined uh, to well under um, a billion, still, of course, far too high, and there's still inequalities, which in some parts of the world are growing. But despite that, there has been a tremendous transformation, I would say, of, of humanity, remarkable progress in recent decades. And that's really attested to by the trends in the left side of this graph. The world population's gone up to over 7 billion, as you know, uh, the real um, GDP is now uh, over 70 trillion, of course, annually. There's been a massive increase in investment, primary energy use, fertilizer consumption, and I won't read them all out, but you can see that there's a whole range of trends here which are expressing and, and examples of these dramatic changes. So they've really been uh, generating the energy and the food and the resources which has underpinned our ascent, you might say, into the Anthropocene. But of course that's come at a considerable price, and the, the price has been largely borne by the Earth systems. And there, those trends are seen on the right-hand side of this slide. You can see CO2 emissions, for example, now, as we go date, so it's now over 400 parts per million, about 406 parts per million, something of that order. That's, of course, the most important greenhouse gas. It's very long-lived, so when you put it up in the atmosphere, about 25% of it will be up there for 1,000 years or more, something of that order. So it's a, it's, a, it's a legacy that we're leaving to future generations unless we can work out ways of extracting it from the atmosphere. And it's accompanied by all these other changes. Surface temperature changes now about one degree, but over. Um, dramatic declines in, uh, well, marine fish capture has peaked 
I was going down, I'll say a bit more, more about that later. Domesticated land, we've probably exploited most of the land that we can exploit. It's, as you can see, it's plateauing out, so we've been exploiting land for growing food, obviously, but also um, wood and other, other products. And we've seen dramatic uh, degradation of the biosphere, both the terrestrial and the marine. So biodiversity loss probably a hundredfold greater than pre-human times, something of that order. Um, and we're also depleting uh, fresh water. So much of the fresh water is stored in aquifers, which can't be replenished on human life scales. In many parts of the world, we're, we're depleting those quite rapidly. So this has led to the concept of planetary boundaries, which is shown on this slide from Will Stefan and, and um, uh, Rockstrom, Young and Rockstrom. And what they postulate is that uh, there is a safe space somewhere illustrated somewhere around here, within which humanity can flourish. And there are these finite boundaries um, within, uh, and many of these boundaries we're now pushing at the limits of them. Now, there have been some criticisms of this concept, and indeed one can see that in some cases there may be fairly clear established boundaries, like in climate, for example, maybe two degrees, for example. Others, much more complex, like novel entities or toxic compounds, there's not going to be a single boundary there. It <clears throat> depends really on the mix of these compounds. Um, and ocean acidification, probably still within, relatively well within that boundary, but things are rapidly changing. So uh, this concept has been quite influential, and I think it's a useful concept, even despite some of its flaws, because it does remind us that we live on a small planet uh, with a population probably of over 10 billion by the end of the century. So we need to think about strategies which will sustain this population more equitably than we do at the moment within these um, physical uh, constraints. So what are the implications, really, of uh, this dramatic environmental change for human health? And there are essentially um, three broad categories of ill health that could arise from these dramatic changes that are seen on the, the other side of, of this slide. So the, the direct effects, which are in the case of climate change, for example, heat, extreme heat, extreme events, increased frequency and intensity. Ecosystem-mediated effects, which might be emerging infectious diseases, uh, vector-borne diseases, changes, distribution, dengue, for example, <coughs> waterborne diseases, and of course food supply and undernutrition through a range of different uh, mechanisms. And then there's this third category, which is the most difficult to quantify because there are so many uncertainties, the sort of socially mediated effects, pushing more people back into poverty because of environmental change, migration, population displacement, and of course, conflict. So all these different changes and more, which I haven't uh, got space to put on this slide, could be working singly um, and together in ways that we still don't fully understand to impact on these different health uh, outcomes. But there are also links between global environmental change and some of the um, environmental impacts that we're familiar with at the moment. So, for example, there are obvious links between air pollution and climate change. Um, air pollution, as you know, is a, is a major cause of deaths and, and ill health. Um, quite a lot of that comes from energy use. Some people have questions whether it's actually 85%. It might be slightly different than that, but that's an estimate from the International Energy Agency. So the link there is that Many of the activities that create air pollution are also those that release greenhouse gases. Um, and um, coal burning, for example, burning of other fossil fuels, and in low-income countries, the burning of solid fuels in, in households for domestic energy, which contributes uh, pollutants like black carbon, for example. So what about the direct effects of climate change um, itself? Well. Um, this is just a slide from the recent Lancet Countdown report. The Lancet Countdown aims to track progress on health and climate change. So um, it's been funded by the Wellcome Trust uh, to have regular reviews of the ways in which climate change is impacting on health and the implementation of policies to prevent or mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and to adapt to climate change. So the recent report, for example, uh, <coughs> modeled the likely increase in the number of vulnerable people exposed to heat wave events as a result of warming since the turn of the century, an estimated perhaps an extra 125 uh, million people exposed, although of course with a lot of 
interannual variability as, as you'd expect. But it's not just exposure to extreme heat waves, which as we know cause increases in death. In temperate countries there's also declines in cold-related mortality. But in some parts of the world, the deaths from increased heat are likely to vastly outweigh the reductions in cold-related mortality. But another important impact is the effect on uh, labour productivity. So as the temperature increases, of course, it becomes progressively more difficult for people to work outdoors. So if you're a subsistence farmer or a cane cutter or an outdoor labourer of some kind, your work rate, your work capacity goes down with increased heat. And there are different ways of expressing that. The common metric that uses the wet bulb globe temperature, which integrates both humidity um, and temperature. And this estimate, again, coming from the Lancet Countdown, suggested that there had been declines, again, estimated declines in labor capacity, perhaps around 5% or so since the turn of the century, and particularly experienced in these kind of um, areas here where the dark, where you see the dark uh, red. So what that tells us is that as the climate warms, we're likely to see perhaps more people pushed into poverty, or at least we'll have to adapt in all sorts of ways to increasing heat. And there's a lot of research going on at the moment to try and define the health and economic impacts of that, but also whether there might be potential adaptation strategies. And you know, even by the end of the century, it's unlikely that all the outdoor laborers living in the global south will be sitting in air-conditioned tractors or whatever. You know, they're still going to be working, many of them, outdoors. So in terms of changes in heat-related excess mortality, this is just a recent paper by my colleague um, Gas uh, Antonio Gasparini. Actually, has now come out in Lancet Planetary Health a few weeks ago. And they looked at data from over 450 sites around the world. And the dark red dots show you where there's going to be an increase um, in mortality. This is a fairly extreme climate scenario, um, RCP 8.5, which is one of the high emission uh, scenario. And you can see particularly in Southeast Asia, Southern Europe, to some extent Southeast USA, um, Africa, we just don't know because we don't have much data on African cities. And that's a real gap that we're trying to fill at the moment. But based on the data we have, and extrapolating forward, we can say there's likely to be increases in heat-related mortality later in the century, which will outweigh the decreases in cold-related mortality, particularly in these dark red sites shown on this slide. But of course, it isn't just the direct effects. It's also, as I mentioned earlier, the effects on, on crop yield. And one of the striking uh, features of that is you, you, you see the top part of this, the red parts, are where we like to see reductions in crop yield, particularly around the middle of the century, as a result of increased temperature. There may be other mechanisms as well, which are not captured by these models, like increased in pests, for example. Um, but this is really just looking at the more direct effects of climate change. And this is uh, then, com you can compare it with the Global Hunger Index, and you can see that there's an overlap, particularly in Asia, in, in Africa. So those parts of the world which experience hunger today are also likely to be those that are affected by declining crop yield uh, in the future by around mid-century. There may be some areas, the green at the top there, where we're going to see increases in crop yield. But we don't know how long that will be sustained, and we don't know whether poor people will be able to afford to buy food, which might well be more expensive on the global market. And of course, there may be increased climate variability and increased food uh, price spikes as well, which, as we know, are very difficult for poor populations to, um, to deal with. So the best estimate we have, uh, done by the Oxford Group, done by Marco Springman and others, is that perhaps an extra half a million deaths or so by mid-century as a result of climate change. But a lot of uncertainties could be a lot worse, might be better if we can adapt quickly, but still a lot of uncertainty there. Probably an underestimate overall because they don't take into account many of the more indirect effects like increasing pests and so on. And we are seeing, by the way, that after many years of progress, as seen on this slide, um, the prevalence of undernourishment is starting to increase. The number of people undernourished is estimated to have gone up, up to about 815 um, million, something of that order. The cause of that, we can still debate. It does seem to be related to climate variability. It might be an early signal of climate change. I think it's not entirely clear um, what's actually causing it. But it is a concern at the moment that um, after this progress, hunger is now starting to increase 
again. And of course, this is particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, many, uh, nearly 40 million people face um, food insecurity in these conflict-afflicted countries, which are on the bottom part of the slide here, um, as you can see. So that uh, shows that there's certainly no grounds for complacency. But it's not just a question of uh, crop yields. It's also probably um, nutritional quality as well. And as we increase the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, that fertilizes, that stimulates the growth of some crops. That's been known for many, many years. It's, been, it's used in greenhouses. They pump more CO2 in to stimulate crop growth. But the, the problem is it also affects nutrient content or concentration. That's shown in this meta-analysis. <coughs> and what you can see here is that um, some of these important micronutrients like iron and zinc, for example, decline as you increase the CO2 level. So that means that we may have decreasing crop yields in some part of the world, but we're also getting potentially decreasing uh, micronutrient concentrations as a result of the CO2 fertilization. And about 2 billion people or so already suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. Some work we've been just doing recently, I mean, most of the work on this is, looks at um, staple crops, the cereal crops, the four big cereal crops. But we've been doing some work on fruit and vegetables. The reason we're interested in fruit and vegetables is because they're an important protective um, factor for non-communicable diseases. So we know that uh, large numbers of deaths are associated with a suboptimal concentration or co sorry, consumption of fruit and vegetables which protect against heart disease, some types of cancer, stroke, um, and so on. And this is a systematic review that um, we've been just doing recently. My colleague Pauline Shieldbeek has been leading this. And what we've been looking at is the effect of multiple environmental stressors on fruit and vegetable yields. This slide just shows you vegetable legumes. So the vertical line is zero effect. And what you can see is that increasing uh, temperature, um, particularly if you're already at over 20 degrees, so that's most of the tropics and subtropics, you get big declines in yield. Ozone level, that's tropospheric ozone, which of course is important. Air pollution, which will probably increase under climate change. And water availability, which reflects not just climate change, but also the, the exploitation of aquifers. So that's all negative. There may be these positive effects of CO2 in some cases, but as I've said, these are likely to be outweighed by the negative effects, and they're also associated with uh, changes in the quality of, of, of foods. So some countries are facing particular challenges, and, and this is just an example of India. Um, India faces these multiple challenges, which are occurring simultaneously. So they have population growth, which is fairly steady population growth. Um, dietary change, seeing westernization of the diet to some extent, particularly in the big cities, the rise of hot processed foods, um, fast foods, and so on. You've got groundwater depletion, which varies, as you can see from this uh, map here, different parts of India experiencing different levels of groundwater depletion. So the red areas are where you're getting high um, withdrawals high ratios of withdrawals for the available supply. So you can see, for example, Rajasthan is uh, facing quite severe constraints on fresh water availability, and of course, um, climate change. So our group's been doing some work on the environmental footprint of different diets in India, and the prospects of dietary change to reduce the environmental impact, but also improve health. This is just one example of the difference between European diets and Indian diets. So um, European diets have a higher greenhouse gas emissions, shown by that bar there. Probably largely because we consume more animal products per, per capita. Obviously, me, um, ruminants, um, uh, methane from ruminants is, is an important greenhouse gas. Then um, the green water footprint uh, is, is higher in Europe than it is in India, but the blue water footprint, which is the irrigation water, the groundwater, is higher in India. So they're exploiting their limited uh, supply stores of fresh water to, to grow um, this food to a greater extent than, than Europe is. Um, so that shows you that there are particular, I think, challenges. It starts off with a lower baseline, the environmental footprint, but also faces significant challenges in the future. We're looking now at potential dietary changes that might help to obviate or offset some of these, these challenges. And we are seeing that droughts, of course, which are projected to increase in intensity and frequency under climate change, particularly later on in the century, that's a fairly extreme 
um, scenario at the top there. But in 2015, 14% uh, of the land area is already se severe to extreme drought. Of course, one can't necessarily say that a single year is due to climate change, but it's the kind of thing that um, we might expect to see um, as time goes on. So that combination of, of drought and freshwater depletion is going to prove particularly challenging. And you can see some parts of the world, like the Mediterranean, parts of Latin America, southern Africa, southern parts of the US, particularly likely to be affected. And this map just then looks at water stress by country. So this is the aquifer problem. Um, and you can see that some areas like uh, North Africa, much of Asia, really severely water stressed already. If you take, for example, the, the Arab world, the per capita availability of fresh water in the Arab world has declined by about 75%, something like that, over the last 50 years or so. So they are facing real um, challenges in addressing food requirements or importing a lot of uh, water through uh, obviously imported crops. Um, and they're desalinating in some parts of, uh, of the Middle East, desalinating uh, seawater that brings with its own environmental problems. So these are uh, burgeoning uh, problems, challenges of fresh water availability over and above climate change. But also, I mean, one of the big drivers of biodiversity loss, of course, is the food and agriculture system. So in order to grow food, to feed the growing world population, we are, of course, converted, or we have historically converted land to provide food, to some extent other products as well. And it's interesting that um, there's about a quarter of a million, some, something like that, um, globally identified plant species. And of these, about 7,000 have been used as crops for food by humans throughout history, of something of that order. Um, currently, rice, maize, wheat provide over 50% of the world's calories for plants, so it's quite a narrow base. And 12 uh, crops, together with five animal species, provide about three quarters of the world's energy intake. So you can see that we're relying on a very narrow spectrum of the total diversity available to us. So you can provide enough dietary energy supply even without diversity. You can feed people relatively poor quality diets, lots of carbohydrates or whatever. But it's much more difficult to uh, satisfy micronutrient uh, supply without diversity. And as I've already said, about 2 billion are micronutrient deficient. So there's this combination of problems that, on the one hand, agriculture is responsible for much of the land use change, which is causing biodiversity loss. On the other hand, it's becoming increasingly monocultures or depending on a very narrow range of species, which of course brings with it its own vulnerability. I mean, if you get you know, a particular disease or whatever that wipes out a particular crop, then it means that humanity is in increasingly vulnerable to that very narrow uh, base of, of crops. And we can't look to the oceans, really, to kind of make good what we're um, losing from, from the land. So um, this is just shows you fish fishery decline. Um, and uh, what it shows is that we're, we're actually seeing decreasing uh, yields now. Much of this is due to industrial fishing. Um, so we're seeing big uh, industrial fishing boats off the shores, often of quite low-income countries that don't have the kind of regulatory framework to prevent this overfishing. And they are essentially sort of sucking out a lot of the marine resources from um, many uh, poorer nations. And um, this small-scale artisanal fishery is only responsible for a very small part of, of the issue. So we know that about, well, over 2 billion people depend on fish or seafood of some kind for 20% or more um, of their uh, protein intake. And so these populations are likely to be particularly vulnerable to fishery decline. And of course, that will be amplified by climate change, which is changing the species distribution. So we're already seeing fish are migrating northwards uh, into, so warm water fish are migrating northwards, for example. And of course, uh, ocean acidification, which is affecting uh, the species balance in, in, uh, in parts of the ocean. So overall, um, by the mid-century, there'll be perhaps two billion more people than today, three billion more in the middle class with increasing demands for animal products and other high-impact products. Fisheries are in decline. Climate change will have a double whammy on oceans and um, the agriculture. And this CO2 fertilization issue is reducing nutritional quality. So 
A key research priority now is understanding the effects of these multiple social environmental changes on the quality and quantity of food and trying to develop counter strategies. Just to move through very quickly a few other impacts, rising seas could affect about 1.4 billion people um, by mid-century or so, many of them in the very highly populated deltaic regions where you've got rapidly growing populations. We are already seeing some work that, again, my colleague Pauline Shieldbeek and Aniri Khan, who used to be based here at Imperial, did on the health effects of salt water intrusion in coastal Bangladesh. One of the things that happens as the sea level rises and you dam rivers to create shrimp farms or whatever you're doing in, in, in Bangladesh, uh, you get salt water intrusion into the coastal aquifers and that increases the salt intake and that seems to be increasing blood pressure, high blood pressure in pregnant women and non-pregnant women. And it varies throughout the year depending on the salinity of the, the fresh water supply. So that seems to be a fairly robust finding and there's currently a lot of interest in how one gets around that particular problem. Forest fires or land clearance fires are of course a major public health hazard as it's shown in this slide which illustrates the effects of the fires in Indonesia in 2015. They produced air pollution which was responsible probably for about 100,000 excess deaths, something of that order. And for part of that period the daily emissions of greenhouse gases from these Indonesian fires exceeded those of the whole US economy. So they can cause massive GHG em emissions uh, as you burn the peat, um, or burn the forest to, to clear it. Infectious diseases, uh, obviously in low-income countries, but even in, in Europe, there may be environmental triggers of um, infectious disease threat events. This just shows you some work from the European Centre by Jan Semenza and colleagues. And they suggested that quite a large proportion of the of these events could be linked to the natural environment, changes in the natural environment, um, in climate, and the human-made environment, providing new niches, uh, niches for vector species, for example, and bringing humanity, the human populations, into contact um, with uh, disease-transmitting agents. And of course, many of the drivers of recently emerging infectious diseases in humans are from wildlife, and these are, this is from um, uh, the State of the Knowledge Review by the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, many of these related to land use change, food industry change, and other environmental triggers. So we can expect to see more of these uh, diseases in the future. We may come back to that in the discussion. And, and finally, conflict. Still very, very controversial. A lot of interest, uh, a lot of debate about whether con conflict is linked to environmental change or not. This is one paper. It's a case study, so by itself it doesn't provide you know, clear evidence, but it's a kind of consistent story in this case. So the drought um, caused drying of the main river in Syria. You had um, movements of populations from rural areas into urban areas. The apartment prices in Damascus doubled. Um, wheat food prices uh, doubled, and uh, the drought continued over many years. And of course, the repressive response of the Assad regime led to the kind of tragedy that we're seeing today. So it doesn't mean to say that climate change caused this, but it may have increased the risk of uh, the drought that preceded the event, and it may act in some cases as a kind of trigger, if you like, for conflict. So that's enough of the bad news. Let me um, uh, sort of end by um, trying to articulate a few ideas about how we can address some of these uh, emerging challenges which we're being confronted with in the Anthropocene Epoch. And in our commission report, we identified three challenges that we said had to be met. First of them was what we call the imagination or the conceptual challenge. And, and just to give one example of that, we often conceive um, the increase in gross domestic product as being the key metric of human progress. But it's actually a very poor metric of many uh, aspects of human progress. It doesn't correlate very well, for example, to life expectancy or healthy life expectancy. And of course, it doesn't take into account inequalities. So we need to find better metrics for measuring human progress and the degree to which human progress depends on the unsustainable exploitation of natural systems. The second one was the knowledge challenges. We've invested many billions in biomedical research, and that's great, but we've invested very, very little in trying to understand the relationships between <coughs> human health and the environment. Hardly any research funders have spent money on this. Since our commission report, the Wellcome Trust has committed 70 million 
uh, pounds to this sort of agenda, this planetary health agenda. And a few other research funders are beginning to step up to the plate, but it's still very, very early days. And of course, many of us come from very specific disciplines, and it's no, a single discipline can't tackle this agenda. You really have to work with a range of disciplines, right the way from sort of anthropology to climatology. Uh, so it's a kind of party that ev everyone is welcome to and everyone can contribute to. But we don't quite have the academic mechanisms or the funding uh, mechanisms to <coughs> really stimulate that on the kind of scale that I think we need. So that's something for discussion. And then finally, the implementation challenges. Even when we know what to do, we often don't do it. And we're seeing in the States at the moment actually a turning back, a reversal of progress. So we're seeing a denial of climate change, a denial of air pollution effects, and so on. So we, it isn't just a question of presenting the scientific evidence. It's also understanding the kind of political economy, if you like, um, of these environmental changes. So the UN has suggested that we need to decouple our lifestyles, our improvement of the quality of life from the environmental footprint, we need to detoxify our environment, reduce pollution. We need to increase ecosystem resilience because we can't prevent all environmental change. It's already happened. So we have to adapt to what's already there. And of course, we have to move to a zero carbon economy as quickly as possible. And that brings with it these challenges of integration across sectors and stronger governance. Health is important. The SDGs are an important framework, a way of framing development over the next 13 years or so until 2030. And one of them is specifically focused on health. But that focuses largely, not, complete, not completely, but largely on health care delivery. And the point we make in our report is that actually health is a cross-cutting issue across all these SDGs. Many of them, like poverty, zero hunger, education, gender, water, sanitation, clean energy, sustainable cities, they're all intrinsically linked to health. And without addressing these SDGs, you won't sustainably be able to improve health. So health needs to be seen as a kind of cross-cutting input and an output of the SDGs. So let me, in closing, just give you a few examples of some policies that we think could be useful. Obviously, decarbonisation is one. Uh, this is from the International Energy Agency, which has suggested if we move towards a low-carbon energy system, modest increase in investment, that we could save over 3 million lives from air pollution, whilst lowering energy import bills and a peak in CO2 by 2020. So it is feasible, it would cost a bit more, but when you take into account the many benefits that accrue from the cleaner economy, that can help to offset the costs. That one's a bit complex, I think I don't have time, I'll, I'll slip over that one, I think. Um, how do we get to a cleaner economy? Well, at the moment, of course, we're sort of subsidising um, much of the dirty economy, if you like. We're subsidising fossil fuels. The IMF suggested that if you included, if you valued the adverse effects of air pollution and the other adverse effects arising from the combustion of fossil fuels, then these subsidies amounted to 5.3 trillion a year. We might debate the methodology, but um, if you accept it for a moment, it's, it's a very appreciable um, subsidy in the system. And we know that um, just over 10%, about 13% of greenhouse gas emissions are covered currently by carbon pricing, and that wasn't inadequate. So the problem is that many powerful interests are basing their business model on not paying the full economic cost. So they are obviously going to resist an economy which <laughs> says actually people need to pay the full economic cost of the pollution that they cause or the damage that they cause. And that is going to be a major challenge um, for politics in the coming decades. Cities are absolutely crucial. Uh, the, the future of planetary health, of course, will depend on cities. They are the engines of much of this change and economic uh, activity and so on, and responsible for the lion's share of the energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. And this just is a kind of an example, really, of two cities, which are interesting kind of comparison and contrast. So you've got Atlanta here in the US, population of 5 million or so, Barcelona, um, <coughs> similar population, urban area about 12 times greater in Atlanta than Barcelona, and the transport-related carbon emissions about five or six times higher in Atlanta and Barcelona. It's not difficult to see why that is so. That's because it's very difficult to walk and cycle in Atlanta because it's a very widely distributed city. Um, the mayor and his um, colleagues there are trying to rectify the situation, but they, you know, it's difficult to retrofit 
a very sprawling city and uh, to make it fit for the urban <coughs> economy. So the new cities that are developing now in Africa and so on, they need to be designed in a different way than the kind of cities that we, uh, many of the cities that we've seen. So there's all sorts of policies. I don't have time to go into in detail, but just some in the transport sector, for example. So we're seeing a lot of innovations in transport, which are low carbon and also uh, promote physical activity, some of which are uh, illustrated in this slide, including bike sharing and uh, low emission zones and so on. Um, we see a growing um, evidence base linking transport with health. This is just one from the Biobank study, some colleagues of mine, where they looked at um, um, about 150,000 people in the UK Biobank uh, group and cohort, and they looked at the relationship between body fat and commute mode. And what they found was that people that rely only on their car are likely to have a higher level of body fat than those people who cycle or cycle and walk to work. And there's a kind of dose rela relationship there. The more you walk and cycle, then the, more, the lower the body fat is. I think it's quite a neat kind of um, uh, summary, really, of, of the evidence. So there's lots of potential benefits which could accrue from a transport system which is both less polluting but also encourages physical activity. I'll skip over that one. Um, but it isn't just physical activity. It's also mental health. There's a lot of interest right now in exposure to green space and its potential impacts on mental health. This is just taken from a, a systematic review some years ago. That's the no effect line there. And you can see that exposure to green space seems to reduce displeasurable moods and increase pleasurable moods uh, there. And uh, there's been a growing literature now on the benefits of green um, space exposure. It doesn't always happen. It depends how you design the green space, whether people feel secure in it, whether they actually use it, and so on. But there is that potential to improve health through improved access to um, green space. Tree planting is another one. A lot of interest in tree planting in cities, either to reduce the urban heat island effect, uh, <coughs> to protect against air pollution, um, and so on. There are some adverse effects as well. We can think about pollen. Different types of trees um, emit different types of pollutants, and so on. But overall, there are uh, with the right kind of policies, real potential for, for benefits. Housing, I'll slip over. Um, this is um, an example of a, a Finnish city which uh, has articulated a plan for the future where it sees itself as moving over the next few decades by mid-century to a city that emits no CO2, has zero waste, sees waste as a resource rather than something to be thrown away, uh, promotes, uh, where possible, locally grown healthy food, recycles water, um, and aspires to live to what they call a one-planet ecological footprint. At, at present, if everyone lived like the average North American, you'd need five planets, something of that order, um, to absorb the pollutants and so on, um, and about uh, three planets for the average uh, European. So what they're saying is, by mid-century, what they want to aspire to is having a kind of circular urban economy which doesn't take out more than its fair share, doesn't create more pollutants than the earth can absorb, and creates um, healthy uh, local populations. Diets and agriculture, I don't really have much time to cover that, but just to say we and others are doing a lot of work on healthy diets and the effects on um, greenhouse gas emissions on health, water and land use, and I, I can talk about that in discussion if people are interested. Uh, there's quite a lot of evidence now around healthy diets and indeed some novel technologies that are coming on stream as well, which I could mention if anyone's interested. Redesigning the energy water food nexus, which is a crucial nexus for human health. Um, this is one example here about providing clean energy in low-income countries, reducing air pollution. Um, much less uh, land degradation and deforestation because less firewood needs to be used and more sustainable uh, water use. Using ecosystem strategies to regulate fresh water, for example, protect against floods and improve air quality. So there's increasing evidence that protecting ecosystems can also improve human health. Moving towards uh, an environmentally sustainable health system. We know, for example, in the US, the health system probably emits about 10% of greenhouse gases, a bit less here in the UK. So a lot of interest in developing these environmentally sustainable health systems, promoting more 
environmentally sustainable behavior and increasing the resilience of the health system to environmental change. Moving towards disruptive change, which can promote health and environmental stability. And this is an interesting example that compares the Easter parade in Fifth Avenue, New York in 1900. You see it was all horses and carriages. By 1913, complete change, all motor vehicles. So within 13 years, there was this disruptive technology, the motor vehicle, that completely transformed the landscape. Now we're dealing, of course, with the long-term effects of the motorization of our society using fossil fuels. But there's no doubt it was a disruptive technology. So people are now searching for more beneficent disruptive technologies, whether they be in the transport or energy or other sectors. And this is just one designer's vision of a, a new disruptive transport um, technology. So these are technologies that can rapidly be taken up um, and improve uh, human health and well-being and sustainability. So we're aiming to move towards a healthy circular economy, which emphasizes remanufacturing, reuse, sharing of goods. You know, we don't all need to own a car, do we? We can share, you know, if we want mobility services, let's buy mobility services. We don't all need to have uh, our own private cars, for example. And reducing waste, as I say, seeing waste as a resource. So let me end, um, despite the sort of slight doom and gloom at the first half, let me end on a, on, on a positive note and say that whilst there are real scientific challenges ahead and indeed, indeed challenges to the political economy of our society ahead, our conclusion was that there are a lot of solutions. So I think we can argue that they do lie within reach. Um, overall, we have to base them on the redefinition of prosperity to really focus on the what matters to human societies, the quality of life, delivery of improved quality, uh, health for all, and so on. But this has to be combined with respect for the integrity of natural systems if we're going to sustain um, these advances in the long term. So I'll stop there, but very happy to um, answer questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Uh, and we'll probably talk about this graph shortly in the public council. And there's a lot of work going on on the mental health aspects and regeneration and so on, physical health aspects. Yes. Um, and that connection is really easy for politicians and people to make and to um, action. But um, climate change and the wider impact seems to be a bit too far. So I wonder how we can make that connection to you. Yes. Well, I think it's also about articulating policies which um, provide near-term benefits as well as the long-term benefits. It is very difficult for a policymaker whose focus is probably going to be on their re-election or on satisfying their constituents to think 30 or 40 years ahead, much as we in the scientific community might wish them to do so. So what we and others have been trying to do is to articulate policies which would bring near-term benefits as well as long-term benefits, hence the emphasis on this idea of co-benefits or ancillary benefits, multiple benefits, some people call them, of different policies. So we think that's a way of engaging policymakers now, but at the same time uh, also helping to move us towards this trajectory towards long-term uh, sustainability. I think the other aspect of, of, of the imagination is um, also the imagination within the scientific community. Because we ourselves, I mean, I was brought up in quite a kind of narrow disciplinary, you know, with quite a myopic sort of view, you know, quite a narrow tunnel vision, if you like, thinking that a particular discipline, say epidemiology or whatever, in isolation could solve most of the world's problems. <laughs> and, you know, it's clearly not true. And so it seems to me that we also need the imagination within the scientific community to create new dialogues between different disciplines, respecting each other's knowledge, traditions, and so on, and languages, but seeing where we can get added value from new types of collaboration. And we're beginning to see that. I mean, for example, we were just talking at the beginning about how early career researchers are starting to set up these kind of planetary health clubs or whatever, um, you know, in different institutions. And it's kind of happening spontaneously. People are saying, you know, we want to try and understand where the added value comes from this interdisciplinary um, communication and collaboration. So I, I do think there's a lot of activity and real conceptual developments beginning to happen. Maybe it's a lot more work needs to be done, but the shoots, I think, are the green shoots are there. I noticed that 
Yeah. Uh, there any specific plans on sure. taking the photos with it who will be affected? Yeah, yeah, that's helpful, thanks. Now, uh, the reason I did was not because I'm not interested in it, but because I was thinking of the time and I wanted to leave some time for a question. So, yeah, I mean, food is, is, is been, has been neglected in some ways because, you know, it's always neglected in the climate change agenda, particularly food and agriculture as a driver of climate change because, you know, about 30% of emissions come from the food system and land use change and so on. And also, as I said, it's a major driver of biodiversity loss. And um, so we're really just trying to look now at the kind of strategies that could promote healthier diets <coughs> and also reduce the environmental footprint. And as you know, a dietary change is not easy. And individual um, interventions by health professionals, as many of those of you as health professionals know, are not always easy to, to deliver effectively. Having said that, you know, we are seeing some changes in society, and it's been remarkable to see, for example, the movement towards vegetarianism in this country, still a tiny proportion of people, but it seems to be a kind of growing spontaneous uh, uh, social movement, which is an interesting one. Uh, my own view is that I'm all in favour of promoting healthy diets, but I don't think it'll be sufficient. With a population of 10 billion, you know, even if they all ate a healthy, relatively low-impact diet, you're still going to have a big <coughs> environmental footprint. So I think what um, some of us are becoming increasingly interested in, but not pretending we have much knowledge about, are some of these emerging technologies which are occurring. So there's a whole range of different technologies like sustainable aquaculture, for example, cellular agriculture, the use of um, insects as food. Uh, in many cultures, insects are eaten quite widely. We, we may not like it here, but it's quite perfectly acceptable in many cultures. Um, microproteins, of course, would be another one. Um, GM, you know, there's a lot of opposition to GM, but GM also has a lot of promise. To my mind, the problem is not so much technical as who controls the technology. And I think some of the opposition has got confused between the technology and the political control of that technology. So I think there's a lot of potential options. We don't fully understand which are the best ones. We think some of the emerging evidence shows that some of these technologies can have much lower environmental footprint. Um, and I think we've got to look at them all because I think you know, with a population of 10, 11 billion, we, we, can, we must leave no, no technology, no stone unturned, if you like. Yeah, no, it's, re it's really interesting. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist, but it's, it's very striking how, um, you know, the, the, whole, um, the whole tone of our political debate is economic growth. Economic growth has to be the priority. Well, I would say, you know, actually what's important is can we sustain, you know, human prosperity, which is not necessarily the same as economic growth, and human well-being in the face of all these environmental changes. So it's partly about establishing a new kind of dialogue and resetting the political agenda. And I don't think it's a particularly left or right issue. I think, to my mind, the whole political spectrum at the moment has this kind of rather myopic kind of feel to it. Um, but also, I think, you know, we also have to acknowledge that currently the economic system that we have, as I mentioned, doesn't really pay the full economic cost of our activities. Even just using kind of fairly conventional economics, you can show that, um, you know, it would be beneficial to have a higher carbon price than we have. Because the actual effects of emitting fossil fuels, including air pollution and climate change itself, um, are costing our society and will cost more in the future. But we don't price our goods with that in mind. So we've got faulty price signals. Um, and that's because we don't, our economy is not based on paying the full economic cost, I would say. Now, economists have been saying for years what we need are things like carbon taxes and so on. But for various reasons, it hasn't actually happened. So to my mind, the interesting question is, why hasn't it happened? And I suppose the answer is manifold, but very powerful interests who are not going to give up their <laughs> fossil fuels very easily, you know, as we're seeing in the US, for example. Um, and uh, also politicians don't like to talk about tax. But you don't have to increase tax. You can just say we're going to change the tax system. We're going to reduce, you know, income tax on poor people. We're going to put it more onto externalities like carbon and other things like that. So but that dialogue doesn't seem to be happening now, not in many societies. So it is a challenge. And I, if there's political economists and historians and political scientists in the room, you know, 
let them pontificate, let them suggest how we should move forward. Yeah, no, I think it's a very important question. If you look at the environmental impact of the health system, you know, when the NHS Sustainable Development Unit here, which is a remarkable organisation, I think it's a massive organisation, about three people, do extraordinary work, uh, you know, quantifying the impact of the NHS on the, uh, on the environment, uh, really amazing work. And um, David Pension, of course, recently retired, was, was leader of that for many years. So they found that, that pharmaceuticals and sort of embedded carbon in products that the health service buys were the biggest single um, emitter of carbon. I always assumed it was hospitals and energy providers and so on. Uh, but no, it's, it's apparently the embedded carbon in, in these products. So there's a lot that can be done by working with pharmaceutical companies and equipment suppliers and so on, <coughs> helping them to move towards low carbon sorts of energy where possible, energy efficiency and so on, and also reducing waste. I mean, we know a lot of prescribing. I mean, probably half of what I prescribed in my career, you know, probably went down the pan, I expect. But um, so, um, you know, we know there's an enormous amount of waste at the moment in, in, uh, in the way in which we operate. And polypharmacists, you know, look at how we deal with perking on about 10 different drugs. <coughs> don't get used to. So, you know, there's a lot we can do within the health system itself once you start to think of it through this planetary health lens. Yeah, no, that's that's a really important point. I, I, I you know, I, I didn't actually cover it. I do in some talks, but, but uh, I didn't. So, um, no, it's a really important point, and obviously we could spend a whole sort of meeting of conference uh, on that population issue. What I would say is this: um, you know, we know that over 200 million women at the moment want access to modern contraception, can't get access to it. So that should be priority number one, because that will reduce family size, will also reduce um, local environmental change, and will produce immediate health benefits child mortality and reduce maternal mortality. So that should be an absolute priority. It's a fantastic investment and it's a human right, so we should really be emphasizing that. Uh, at the same time, we can't blame um, the overpopulation by poor population. We can't say that this is what's causing these dramatic environmental changes, because it's not. I mean, it may be contributing in some aspects, but most of it is driven by the high consumption patterns in, in high income countries, certainly greenhouse gas emissions probably only 5 to 10 percent coming from the poorer population. So it's an ethical issue because the impacts are being going to be felt most by the populations that have contributed the least. However, having said that, um, you know, reducing population growth, as I said, is a, is a big benefit. It also reduces the number of vulnerable people because, you know, most of the impacts, the big impacts in the next few decades are going to be in countries with a high population growth. So if we can reduce that population growth in a humane way, respecting people's rights, then that will also reduce the number of vulnerable people. So yeah, there's lots of arguments for, for tackling population, but we shouldn't confuse that by saying, well, we in the rich world don't need to do anything because actually it's due to overpopulation. Well, it isn't. You know, it's, it, it has to be addressed, but you have to put it in perspective. 